Thank you everyone for joining us for another Learning Lunch. This session is co-hosted by Format Approved and eGestalt Technologies. Thank you for joining us. The presentation is titled Policies, Procedures, and PHI HIPAA Compliance Simplified. And we're going to go over some uh, efficient and low-cost options for dealing with your HIPAA compliance. Excuse me, I noticed there's a typo on the title slide. I'll take care of that after today's session. Some brief introductions before we begin. Anupam Sahai is with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us, Anupam. It's always a pleasure. It's my pleasure to join all of you. As you can see on the slide, Anupam is a co-founder and the president of Egestalt Technologies. He's a recognized expert in areas of healthcare IT, cloud computing, security and compliance and networking. Uh, it's truly an honor to have him with us because he brings a depth of experience to these questions. So um, thank you, Anupam, for sharing your expertise. As for myself, I'm Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with Format Approved. Uh, I also have experience in HIPAA and compliance training in particular and have helped a variety of organizations work with their policies and procedures and training requirements. Some quick housekeeping notes before we get to our first slide. Remember that you can ask questions of us at any time during today's session. We're going to keep it casual, we'll go back and forth between the two of us as we cover this subject. Um, we may answer questions on the fly, but generally we're going to hold those questions for the end of the session. If we don't get to your question, we'll follow up with a written response. Also, people always ask us if they can get a copy of the slides, especially for a session that's bound to be as enlightening as this one, if I can uh, make that prediction on our behalf. Um, rest assured that after the session, we'll send you an email. You'll be able to get the slides of the event. There's also going to be a recording of the event for you. So don't worry about any of that. We'll take care of those details after the session. For now, just enjoy uh, today's session, and thank you again for joining us. So Anupam, I thought maybe you could address this just to set the stage for us. Um, you know, many of our audience may know this already, but HIPAA compliance has changed in recent years, and I think it's really changed the, the name of the game a little bit. Maybe you could review for our audience how there have been some important changes. Sure, Brian. So HIPAA, the HIPAA Act, as it were, was enacted in 1996. And, and that was the beginning of, uh, of a program recommendation from HHS that uh, there's a need to protect healthcare information. I guess the browser was invented in 1994, so it was uh, about that time. And, uh, but the enforcement and the deployment of HIPAA was very minimal until 2009 when the High Tech Act came about. This was part of the Recovery Act in 2009 where a lot more emphasis was put on ensuring the privacy and security of the protected health information. So really the enforcement and the incentives around enforcement started with the 2009 High Tech Act. And, and of course the Omnibus Rule which was enacted in 2013, it was uh, put in place by Jan 2013 and the enforcement started in September 2013. And as a part of the High Tech Act, there were two key things that were done, which was, again, reinforced with the omnibus tool. One was that there was a federal incentive put together for implementation of the electronic medical records through the Meaningful Use Grants. And about $28 billion was put aside by the government to incentivize medical providers to deploy electronic medical records and, and so that was the, the, the carrot as it were. The, the stick part of it where the fines were increased from earlier it was about a maximum of $50,000 for, uh, for a particular medical provider per year. Now that fine has been increased with the Omnibus Act to about $1.5 million per incident at the highest level of penalty and there's no upper limit. So Essentially, the evolution of HIPAA, HIPAA compliance over the years has, has moved in the direction of enforcement in terms of incentivizing medical providers to ensure privacy and security of PHI information. Well, thank you, Anupam. That covered a lot of ground quickly. Uh, you know, we wanted to go over this 
material quickly, but there's been so we could talk about this for the entire hour because there's been so many changes. One of the big changes is that there's now you know inf money for enforcement as well, and there's a permanent audit program, random audits that go out to both covered entities and business associates, and the breach protocols for when folks do lose PHI when that uh, information is lost or accessed improperly. That's much stricter than it used to be. There's all new standards around uh, how people have to report that, and they've removed harm, for example, as one of the um, standards for whether or not there's a breach. You don't have to show harm now. If you lose the data, that in itself is a breach. So all of those changes are going on right now, and it's really changed the whole climate for um, healthcare privacy and data security. So. Again, I think this would best be addressed by you, uh, Anupam, as these file in for us. Oh, excuse me. How should an organization prepare for, the, for these audits that now the permanent program has been launched? Tell us about how policies and procedures have a part in that. Yeah, so in order to meet the HHS audit pro protocol requirements, and when I'm, what I mean by audit protocol is that if HHS for some reason selects your organization or anybody that you know for an audit, there are certain set of things that they're looking for. And, and in order to meet or exceed the requirements from an HHS audit protocol perspective, every organization needs to put together certain basic mechanisms, certain basic uh, uh, policies, procedures, and, and uh, activities in-house in to ensure that they're complying with HIPAA, that they are maintaining the HIPAA compliance status, and not only that, that they have proof to show with an audit trail that the HIPAA compliance issues are being addressed. So what you see here are nine steps that we recommend as being the key, key steps, key cornerstones of any HIPAA program that you implement. And if you look at number one through number four, they're really around scoping and understanding HIPAA, putting together a security and compliance plan to deal with HIPAA requirements, and, and getting the organization prepared with training and education and assignment of roles to implement a set of policies and procedures that are going to be the, the guidelines for implementing HIPAA. And the difference between policy and procedure that, that we'll talk about later is really between Policies specify what needs to be done, and procedures are really about how you want to go about doing it. So the steps one, one to four are setting the framework, as it were, in the organization to make sure that as an organization you are, you are implementing the basic steps and requirements from a HIPAA perspective. And then steps five through nine is about doing the HIPAA assessment, assessing the PHI critical assets for vulnerabilities, and, and, uh, and then doing the overall security risk analysis, whether you want to be getting the meaningful use grants or not, you're required by HIPAA to, to do security risk analysis. And then once you know the gaps that exist and the remediation that needs to kick in to, to implement the safeguards and controls to make sure that your risk exposure is minimal. And, and of course, every organization needs to have a breach notification plan so that they are able to, for whatever reason, if the breach does happen, they're able to communicate that to all the stakeholders, the HHS and the, and the patients and other uh, upstream entities. Uh, if you're a BA, you need to communicate that to, to the covered entities. So the whole framework and, and uh, reporting mechanism, policy mechanisms that are required by HIPAA is all, all implemented and specified here. And finally, having a proof of compliance which is really your, your uh, statement about what, th what are the various actions that the organization has taken towards HIPAA compliance. Having an audit trail is a key requirement. And again, this needs to be repeated regularly so that you're not only compliant in a particular point in time, but you're, this is an ongoing effort and, and it needs to be repeated uh, on a regular basis to ensure if things go out of compliance, you're monitoring your status and ensuring that any anything that goes out of compliance is pushed back into compliance. 
Well, we're going to keep touching on these issues um, throughout this session here. And, you know, I think it's useful to take a step back and just look at, you know, why are proper policies and procedures essential to HIPAA compliance? I might start on this slide just to address it in general, because you can see from the steps, the process that Anupam outlined uh, in the last slide that it's, a, it's a, of the very foundation of compliance. But just to state it again, if you don't have a set of robust policies and procedures, and we're going to talk more about what makes a set of policies and procedures robust, not only do they have to be robust, they also need to be up to date. So with the recent regulatory changes, if you know, you're using a set of policies and procedures from 2005 when the security rule was issued, those need to be updated and uh, various sections of your documentation need to be updated in ways we'll talk about here in a little bit. If you don't have those things in place, you can't be in HIPAA compliance. That's how fundamental the policies and procedures are to being compliant. So, you know, without getting too much into the details, if you look at the HIPAA security rule um, and you look at the administrative safeguards, that's one of the major sections of that security rule, over and over again, it explicitly calls for policies and procedures that have to do with some aspect of how protected health information, or PHI, is handled. So, you know, it's not going too far to say this just flat out. If you don't have proper policies and procedures in place, you are not compliant with HIPAA. It's impossible. And in fact, it's actually, you know, one of the key elements uh, for being compliant. And just to illustrate that point further, you know, if, uh, if you look at HIPAA regulations, sometimes people think about HIPAA regulations as technological or technical standards, and certainly those are part of what needs to be done to be compliant. But a lot of people can be surprised that about half of the security rule requirements concern policies and procedures. And so for that reason, people sometimes say HIPAA is administrative. You know, which again isn't to say that there aren't technological aspects of it. Um, that's an important part of being compliant as well. But even those primarily technological requirements often involve policies and procedures in ways that we're going to talk about more as we go through this session. I don't know if you'd like to add more to this slide now, Anupam, um, or if we'll just get to it here in, in the next coming up yeah. slides. Let's keep going. Okay, let's go on then. So this is something that Anupa mentioned earlier. Um, I think it's useful to understand the distinction between policies and procedures. Um, and so one way to think about it is, is that, as Anupam was saying, you know, policies apply to the whole organization, and they're sort of the why, or you could say you know, they're the principle of what it is you're trying to achieve, whereas procedures are detailed steps you take to actually follow those policies. So the idea is that policies are general and adaptable, whereas procedures can be more specific and may need to be updated more often. Um, in our compliance officer course, the analogy we use is to think of the U.S. Constitution. You know, if you look at the provisions of the Constitution or you look at the amendments in the Bill of Rights, those uh, provisions are equivalent to policies, and they haven't changed um, in the main even though they've been around for 200 years. Now the laws, if you look at something like the First Amendment, the laws around how the First Amendment is protected have changed enormously, as they have to have. If you think about you know, the advent of telephones and newspapers and all of these things that have changed so much, those things have changed. And so the laws are like the procedures, the Constitution is more like the policies. It's just one comparison that may be uh, useful to folks. Anupam, anything to add there? No, I think uh, you said it very well. So policies, think of policies as requirements coming from HIPAA, and they tell you what needs to be done. And the how part of it, the implementation part of it, is really where the procedures are coming into play. And, and procedures is where you leverage industry best practices, and you, you need to put together implementation guidance, which should also be part of the policy uh, policy guidance from a high-level perspective. All right, so this is kind of a, a tricky question. Um, I think I'll address this to you, Anupam, if you don't mind. But, you know, people, we always talk about the importance of the security risk analysis. Um, 
And I think people are often, again, surprised that that's actually an administrative safeguard. Can you explain to us why that's the case and how that intersects with policies and procedures in UPM? Yeah, so the risk analysis is really a, a process whereby you are looking at the organization's risk exposure. And the risk exposure could be as a result of any IT assets that are vulnerable or prone to being compromised. It could be because of any other processes that as an organization that you don't have maturity and thereby it can be violated. Or it could be because of any other assets that are critical to the organization. So risk analysis is looking across the company, IT, non-IT assets, and you're trying to get an estimate for the overall risk exposure. So having policies that are rock solid, that tell you how each employee is contributing towards the organizational risk exposure or lack thereof, or it, all IT assets and any critical assets in the organization, they need to follow certain guidelines and, and processes and, and procedures. And so this, these are all bound together by a set of policies that cut across all, all organizational assets. And, and so the risk analysis process needs to look at it holistically and evaluate the complete risk exposure and, and do that in an ongoing fashion so that you are completely on top of uh, any, any things that can be compromised either by internal malicious ins insiders, it could be external hackers, it could be because of uh, new threat threat exposure that are evolving by the day. All of that is looked at holistically from a risk analysis perspective. And the policies are really the first line of defense, as it were, to ensure that you're putting together the best practices in the organization to ensure privacy and security of PHI information. And you know, just to add to that, for folks who have been through an assessment where you're going through, you know, what what uh, sympathetically to say to <laughs> to people, sometimes it seems like an endless list of those questions from uh, NIST that help people, you know, look at their risk. That assessment, so much of it has to do with looking at whether proper policies and procedures are in place. So it really helps, you know, understand what the threat environment or what the risk environment looks like. It's It's one of the basic components of understanding that. So Anupam, when it comes to actually, you know, what should be included in policies, um, what, what are some that an organization really needs to have in place and that need to be updated because of all the changes? Yeah, so here are some example policies that need, need to be in place as part of an organization. And, and these are some example policies. The list is much bigger than this, but to give you a flavor of where these policies policies are coming from. So let's walk from the top. So business associate agreements is really uh, an agreement that every medical provider needs to have with uh, anybody uh, who's a business associate. And, and this agreement tells you about the policy part of it, which, uh, which essentially describes what are the elements that need to be protected, who can share the information, who can access the information. And, and then there's a part of the policy, which is the procedures, which will tell you how do you go about enforcing this policy, implementing this policy. And, and so there, there should be a sample business associate agreement that, a legal agreement that every BA should sign as a part of implementation of this policy. So every policy needs to have the what section, which is what are the requirement, uh, what, what needs to be done and the how part of it as to how do you go about implementing and enforcing the requirements coming from HIPAA. So that's what makes it the complete uh, policy document. Similarly, notice of privacy practices is another very important uh, policy wherein you are informing and taking permission from, uh, from the patients, from the uh, people who are actually sharing the PHI information with you. So there needs to be consent, there needs to be agreement about how the information will be used, if it's going to be used for any marketing purposes, that needs to be uh, agreed to as well. So there are a lot of 
details in terms of what can be sh what can be shared and how it can be implemented and enforced. So, if you walk down this list, all of these are important aspects of HIPAA compliance that deal with internal resources or other external stakeholders who are working with the medical medical community, medical providers to ensure privacy and security of PHI. So that's that's really very key. For example, scope of breach information. It's very important to understand what is covered under a breach notification rule. And um, that needs to be communicated. Uh, that critical information needs to be handled correctly, accessed correctly. So all of these policies are very critical first step to what a, a HIPAA compliance program before you do risk analysis, before you do compliance, these policies, uh, which is an example set, is, is a very, very first step that you would do as an organization. I'd like to add a couple things to that, Anupam. Thank you. That you know, I've been to different doctors' offices in the last uh, few months. I've got some kids, and you know, we're in doing this and that for ear infections and that sort of thing. And I have to say, I always look at their MPP. You know, it's something that everybody hands out. Uh, I, I have yet to not get one, but I also very rarely have seen one that's actually up to date and in compliance. So I think that uh, it's it would be news to most providers that the notice of privacy practices has to be updated uh, because of new requirements that come from the omnibus final rule that you know became final last year. Um, but it does need to be updated. And so some of these folks, you, you go in there and it's a photocopy of a photocopy from you know probably all the way back to 2003 or 2004. And it's something that needs to be, you know, you can't just leave these policies in place and this documentation and never look at it again. <laughs> so if it's been a while since you've looked at these things, do um, do your uh, investigation and due diligence to make sure that you're using currently up-to-date and compliant documentation. The other point on the business associate agreements is that, you know, you had to have business associate agreements in place with everyone that reflect the new language in September, uh, as of September 2013, but we're also coming up on really the last deadline here, which is that they did give you a little bit of extra time, uh, they being the government, if you had pre-existing business associate agreements before the omnibus final rule, maybe you've you know used an organization for several years and you've got the old agreements, well, even those old agreements have to be replaced no later than September 2014. So really next month is the end of that last deadline. So those pre-existing agreements, those are no longer going to be valid. You need to get all of those updated uh, to comply with the law. So those are um, some things that people may not be aware of. I would also just like to mention before we go on, we've got a couple of questions already. If you do have questions about any of this, um, or it can just be about HIPAA in general, feel free to type those into the chat area, and we'll get to as many as time allows at the end of our session. So Anupam, I think this is a great place to, um, you know, to defer to you again, and that is how should policies and procedures be formulated to withstand an audit or a breach investigation? What, what should people be looking for and how these things work? Yeah, so typically uh, a policy should ref, a policy can be leveraged across multiple control requirements or multiple HIPAA. Uh, requirements. So one key thing is that every policy document should cross-reference the various controls or HIPAA requirements that it's, it's meeting. So that's typically the case with a robust HIPAA, HIPAA compliance system. So on the, the screen here, if, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, just so people understand, on the screen here, these controls, so those are federal regulations under the controls that this policy is meant to satisfy. That's right. It's a little hard to see, but you see the numbers 164.308, A32, et cetera, et cetera, in the, in the second row under security and privacy. So those are the control regulations coming from HIPAA citations. These are the legal, uh, legal numbers that uh, specify what HIPAA requirements uh, pertain to that. So all those uh, HIPAA citations need to be referenced in the policy document, which ones are relevant for that particular policy. And the other thing is that um, if, you, if you continuously update and, and track any policy changes, that needs to be 
mentioned in this um, in, in your tool or in your uh, some revision history needs to be maintained uh, ideally through an automation tool and and that's an important uh, audit trail that you need to have as to when the assessment was done what was the policy document and so the association of the assessment and the policy documents that go along with it which can again by the way change and evolve with time needs to be tracked as part of your audit trail history because in 2013 your policy documents could be different from 2014 etc so having a complete audit trail having a complete linkage between assessments that you're doing HIPAA assessments that you're doing and the policies that correspond to it um, is, is very very critical part of your tracking and and proof that you are HIPAA compliant. Well, this really leads us into the um, next slide anyway, which I'd also like to address to you, Anupam, and that is um, you talked about you know the advantages of using a tool to manage this documentation process. What are the advantages to using some kind of online repository or tool? to manage policies and procedures? Yeah, so the advantages is that you're dealing with about 50 odd policy documents, policies and forms that are required by HIPAA. And if you don't organize this thing in a very convenient fashion, then, and remember all of, all of some of these policy documents can change with time. So it's important to have an online repository and preferably a cloud-based repository where you have all the policy documents and if changes and you're able to track them uh, as I said earlier there's a need to cross-reference the policy documents with the various HIPAA citations and as you go through the assessment you want to freeze that snapshot of the policies that you use for a particular assessment and, and again you might do an assessment once a year once every six months so there's a lot of information that needs to be carried through for audit trail purposes for tracking purposes and just for automation and sanity purposes. So what, what is required is some kind of a policy management portal, ideally in the cloud, that serves as a backup repository where you're able to track all the policy documents, the different versions, and how things are changing with time so that at any point in time you can go back and say, what are the policies and assessment, um, assessment um, status that, uh, that was there maybe three years ago? Uh, and and so on and so forth. So think of this as your tax um, tax guidelines, right? Where you need to do a tax assessment every year, and for whatever reason, if you get uh, called in by IRS for a tax filing that you did two years ago, you want to be able to pull up the documentation and the relative and the related supporting evidence to to respond to the requirement or request from IRS. So it's a similar concept here and being able to use an automated tool to manage this whole process is very convenient and in fact required I would say. So we've talked a little bit about this, we've touched on it at least, but you know when it comes to policies and procedures and how they intersect with technology, um, let's talk a little bit more about that and I'll start with this one and then hand it off to, to you Anupa. My, know that you have more expertise in this area than I do, but just to set the stage for it, you know, in the most obvious sense, policies and procedures are really key to governing how technology is going to be used. So you'll have technological controls in place, you know, just to use a simple example of, say, passwords, um, but, but part of that as well is that there has to be policies in place for requiring passwords basically and so what I'm trying to convey here is that policies and procedures and technology really go hand in glove together um, to build your compliant environment and so this is uh, the second bullet on the screen here is something that we're going to talk about in a moment when we get to a, a breach example but think about um, for example an audit log that logs who has access to protected health information well, you know, there's automated tools in place that can send you alerts and that sort of thing that, that are very useful, um, but ultimately there needs to be some administrative, some policy commitment to actually looking at the audit log or uh, it really doesn't do very much good to, <laughs> to log who's getting access to PHI if no one ever looks at it. So um, this goes, this final point here on this screen goes to the point we've made before. Procedures can be very detailed about um, what tech requirements may be, such as what software needs to be used, 
um, and what you know the requirements for password length and that sort of thing need to be, um, whereas the policies are more commitments to um, general principles. But the overall point here is that really technology and documentation go together to build a compliant environment. Um, and I'll just hand it off to you, Anupam, if you would like to add anything to that. Yeah, so to, um, to give you some examples, so the policies include things like a backup, uh, backup strategy, it talks about risk management, it talks about uh, logging and monitoring, it talks about identity management. Those are example policies. To implement these policies um, and to in enforce it, you need technical mechanisms, technical technology to ensure that you are able to follow through and enforce these policies. So the policies could be in the form of uh, a logging tool. It could be in the form of encryption technology. It could be in the form, form of disaster recovery backup software. And, and these are technologies that are implementing the policies. Uh, as, as I said, policies are, they tell you what needs to be done. The how part of it is really the procedure where technology could be a way to implement it. And again, there could be multiple ways to implement the requirements, the what requirements. So there may not be a single way to do disaster recovery backup. And, and so you have a set of choices that need to be made when you're trying to implement um, the mechanisms, the how-to part of the policies. And, and that's a critical, uh, critical bridge to be built. And good policy documents will tell you not just the what part of it, but some, some guidance on what technologies or how the implementation guidance should look like as well. All right, so here we get to uh, have kind of some fun slash scary uh, conversation about just I think it's useful to look at examples of how folks have had breaches um, where they didn't have proper policies and, and procedures or didn't follow them. Um, first of all, I have to confess that as far as we know, the loss of the Hindenburg did not have anything to do with improper uh, healthcare policies and procedures, but it's a fun graphic for uh, trouble. <laughs> so we'll just set that aside for now. I, the first bullet, how about all of them? Well, you know, obviously that's not strictly true, but if you look at, uh, remember that HHS maintains what everyone calls the wall of shame, although HHS doesn't call it that, but most people do. Uh, and we'd be happy to share the website with you. If you go look at that, you'll see that in case after case, breaches often, uh, as a rule, I should say, they involve some aspect of policies and procedures that have not been followed. So, I mean, it's almost uh, without exception that somewhere in there, there's either not proper policies and procedures in place, or they weren't actually followed by the organization. And organizations have been fined by the government for both of those. You know, some organizations have had robust policies and procedures that they've been just completely ignored. Um, and so uh, there's been cases where folks have gotten in trouble for that. But more, more common probably is that folks didn't have good policies and procedures in place to begin with and, and got into trouble. So just a couple of examples here that I think are interesting. Um, if you look at a breach of Idaho State University, um, I can't remember how many records were breached. But I think in both of these cases that we're going to look at here, it's interesting that you, part of it is technological and part of it is a policy failure. So in 2013, Idaho State University's firewall went down and uh, that was a, a technological failure basically. But then it was down for something like seven months. Um, and the reason why it was down so long is that no one was following the uh, university's policies on actually checking their logs and making sure that they were doing the required system activity reviews to see that this thing was down and that they had um, unauthorized access to their system. So you have a technological failure and then you have a policy and administrative failure combined led to a major breach that wound up costing the university $400,000. If you look at the uh, second example on the screen there, this uh, is so far the largest fine that has been uh, levied against anyone for HIPAA violations, although we should say that the government fines, you know, are just a small part, typically, of the expenses that are involved with a major breach. 
uh, because there's all you know there's lawsuits typically and and credit monitoring and that sort of thing that has to be paid for as well. But in any case, to to get to the example, in 2014, the government fined New York and Presbyterian Hospital and Columbia University its largest fine to date, which is 4.8 million dollars. And um, what happened? It's complex. We won't go into all the details, but essentially, they didn't have proper policies on how someone can can hook up their uh, computer to their networks. And so a doctor who was working on application development had a personal computer that he hooked up to their network and then tried to deactivate in the network. And because they didn't have proper policies and procedures in place to govern that, and they had never done uh, a proper risk analysis, the government found, to, to set those policies and procedures in place, it wound up exposing their network to internet search. So something like 7,000 patient records could be searched by Google and it included everything from the records to their status to their lab results to their pharmaceutical prescriptions, all of that stuff. And the, the truly heartbreaking part of it is that the way this was discovered is that the partner of a patient who had passed away uh, unfortunately, she searched for that patient's name and, and all of a sudden through a Google search sees all of their health records. So you can imagine how upsetting that would be to someone who had lost a loved one. Um, shows that this isn't just a matter of satisfying government regulations. It's really, you know, these are people's lives. So, um, you know, that, that sort of brings the human aspect, aspect to it back. But again, in both of these cases, you have, uh, from one perspective, a technological failure but there's also a failure of policies and procedures and, a, and an administrative failure. And those two things together then lead to these large breaches, which cause so much trouble. I, I don't know if you'd like to hop in on that, uh, Anupam, and add to that. Yeah, so think of, uh, you know, you can spend a lot of money to get the best technological tools out there, the best databases, best uh, uh, security tool, but if you don't have the basic uh, set of policies to ensure that the tools are being used correctly, then clearly you can you can fail easily. Uh, you might have the best security um, security door, for example, in your house, but if you forget to lock it uh, using uh, some kind of uh, understanding within the household members, then you're prone to be broken in. So it's a very simple policies essentially lay down the uh, the playing conditions for everybody in the organization as to who's doing what and who's responsible for what so that you can leverage and maximize and optimize the resources from a privacy and, and security um, breach perspective. All right, so uh, we're near the end of our presentation. I know that some folks have already asked uh, questions of us, and so if you've been holding your questions, it does look like we'll have some time for them, so feel free to ask, and we'll do our best to get through all of your questions. Uh, but to look at the requirement for, for providing HIPAA training, I think it's just important to stress that there should be really two parts of, of training around HIPAA. One is that you need, people need to understand HIPAA itself, and the, it's important to remember that HIPAA requires training, so, and it needs to be regular. So those are, uh, that's an important part of compliance that not everyone may be aware of, that you actually have to train on HIPAA um, to be compliant with the law. So people need a basic understanding of what the law requires. But there's another aspect to it that, that is important as well, which is that people in the workforce need to understand what the organization's policies and procedures are. So on the one hand, they need to understand HIPAA, but they also need to understand what the policy and procedure expectations are, you know, depending on their role in the organization for how they're going to handle um, PHI. So I think that's, you know, uh, just there's two parts to it that are really important. Uh, would you like to add anything to that, Anupam? No, I think uh, you, you covered it all. There. All right. Well, as I said, we do have time uh, for questions and answers. Before we get into those, um, I'd just like to take a moment and note that, you know, uh, Format Approved and eGestalt are partners and uh, we're able to offer folks, if you're looking for documentation, um, a very affordably priced starter package that may be of interest to some folks. Um, so you saw a couple screenshots of the eGestalt product there. I'd, I'd like to invite Anupam to take just a moment before we get to questions 
just to explain how it works and how people uh, can make the most of the tool if they do, if they would like to update and upgrade their documentation. Yeah, so what you get uh, in the starter package is a complete policy management portal that allows you to understand what are the different policy documents that need to be put in place. Uh, you also have the ability to edit them, update them, and track revision history, uh, as was mentioned earlier. And you also have uh, interlinking between the different HIPAA citations, uh, the requirements, and the different policy documents. So you have complete a, a, a complete policy document set along with the procedures that, that you need to, uh, need to um, put in place to get the policies implemented. And so it's a complete package that, that you get at the starter package level. And then you have uh, other uh, options to upgrade and buy the full assessment uh, level as well. You can get the complete HIPAA assessment um, or if you want to do network scanning. So there are, different, there are different levels of the HIPAA compliance package that's available at the URL below. And uh, you're welcome to look at it, ask us any questions about it, and we'll be able to help you uh, find the right uh, option there. And I, I'd just like to add to that, uh, thank you, Anupam, that, you know, so you, you, you looked at the examples before where all of the policies in that tool are intimately tied to the controls that they satisfy, which meets that standard that you're looking for if there was an audit or breach investigation. So that kind of goes without saying. But there's also a lot of resources in their um, knowledge base that lets you understand um, what the policies and procedures are getting at. It's, it's basically an automated tool to understand what's at stake in each of these. And as Anupam was mentioning, you know, you can use as much or as little of the tool as you want. I think this, what's great about this starter package is that it's so affordable for people um, who may need to just get their foot in the door. I know a lot of providers, you know, uh, are feeling various financial pressures, so it's certainly a great deal. But then you can see how you can expand that and everything meshes together. So you've got your policies and procedures in place. You've got your risk and uh, assessment. You've got your uh, network scanning, if you're doing the whole package, everything comes together into a seamless whole, which is really, you know, just the ideal for ensuring your ongoing compliance and that everything's up to date. Um, so I think it's really the wave of the future, whether it's, you know, eGestalt, which of course we think very highly of eGestalt, but there's other um, online portals that do, uh, not to eGestalt's level, I would say, but that are attempting similar um, online management of compliance, and I really do think that's the direction that the industry is moving in for so many different reasons. But with that, let's get to questions and answers if we could. Uh, we've got some already. Again, if you'd like to share your questions with us, please do go ahead and share them. Um, so the first question I'll look at here is that someone's asked if there's a place on the HHS website where they can find the most current HIPAA policies for privacy, breach, and security. I, I really don't think you can get pro policies and procedures from HHS. Um, there are sites, you know, there's a great page that I could send you that the Office for the National Coordinator maintains that's got a bunch of different HIPAA resources on it. Um, what I would recommend, of course, is that you look at something like uh, the package you can get here, or if you're just curious about what the requirements are, um, if you go to www.formed training, we have popular HIPAA classes where you can learn more about what those requirements are. You can go and read the security rule, of course, on the government website. You can read the privacy rule. Sometimes reading those regulations is, you know, it'll make you, most people run screaming from it. And it's much easier to take classes that teach you what they're trying to say than to read what the government has to say. But um, I don't think you can get policies and procedures from the government at this point. So we have some questions about BAs, and these are always fun. Um, this one is kind of a basic question about who is required to complete the business associate agreement. Um, would a cleaning crew have to do it, a laundry vendor, subcontractors, equipment maintenance vendors, MD shadowing, insurance carriers, medical charge. Char uh, they're listing a bunch of examples. Um, I'll take this and then if you please jump in uh, if you'd like to. And I, the first thing I'll say is the basic way to understand it is business associates, they, they 
take on that status by having access to protected health information as part of the services they provide to the covered entity. So as a result of that, in the vast majority of cases, folks like cleaning crews and laundry vendors are not going to be considered business associates because their contact with PHI is what the law calls incidental. So I think the idea here is if you're properly handling PHI, it's not left out on a table anyway. And that means that if a cleaning crew comes through to just clean up the office, they shouldn't have any access to PHI as part of their duties to clean your office. So those folks wouldn't usually be considered business associates. But if you're looking at someone who's an IT support firm or something like that, where they're maintaining your network, they, you know, even if they never look at the PHI, they by necessity have access to it. And so that would make them uh, a business associate. The other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes people think that um, insurance companies, for example, are business associates, but those are usually classified as covered entities. And the reason why is that covered entities are any organization that is in some way involved directly in providing health care or in, in collecting payment for health care. So, you know, doctors, nurses, pharmacies, labs, uh, ambulance services, those folks may be subcontractors or third-party vendors, but the law usually would classify those as covered entities. Okay, well, let's shoot this question to you then, Anupam. Um, in my clinical experience as an end user, this person says, I often face the lack of meaningful training, input, and interface evaluation of rules enforced by administration. So they just basically want to follow the regulations. Um, the question is, how often are audits for compliance evaluations discussed with end users? How often are audits discussed with end users? I'm not sure if he means the government or if he means as part of a tool. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, so if the question that, uh, you know, if the... I, I guess one way to throw it out there, you know, is he's saying there's not meaningful training on... Giving you advice for an audit, if that... I'm having... Uh, Anupam is breaking up a little bit on my end. I don't know if... Other folks can hear. I'll try and answer that. Yeah. Okay. I, I think my audio may have gone out for just a moment. Can folks hear me? Yeah. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I <laughs> uh, the, always the the uh, exciting part of GoToWebinar is sometimes it just goes out. So I'm sorry, Anupam. Whatever you're saying, please continue. Anupam. Team marching up, Brian. All right. Well, let's let maybe we can move on to another question and see if we can get that. Oh, I see. Okay, so the user uh, had a point of clarification that is interesting, which is he says the question that he's trying to ask before is the end users are often the last people engaged in uh, compliance, but they're actually the most important folks. So I think. Um, that's an interesting point he raises. Here's another question from... Yeah, Brian, your audio is dropping out. Okay. Anupam, do you want to take over the question and answers? Brian, your audio is dropping a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So... One question is, can myself, as a BA, leverage your PNP package, policy and, uh, policies and procedure package, when we consult with a covered entity? How would that work? Yes, absolutely. It's, um, the policy and procedure document is available um, in the startup package and up, and you're able to leverage this for any deployment, any HIPAA compliance deployment. And as I said, the policies and procedures are the first step in, in getting towards HIPAA compliance, uh, there is the HIPAA assessment along with HIPAA network scanning 
that uh, you can add on to make it into a complete uh, compliance program. Let's see. So another question is, if a small private practice works with attorney offices for WC, I'm not sure what WC means, and personal injury, and the attorneys are not willing to sign the BA agreement, are we still liable or would they be liable for any breach? Now this is an important question. So as per the HIPAA omnibus rule, the latest rule that was enacted in September 2013, now it's the shared responsibility of the covered entity and the BA both to ensure that every BA is, uh, is at least at the very minimum signing the BA agreement and not only that, that they are taking steps to ensure privacy and security of PHI. So as a covered entity, you have a responsibility and liability along with the BA to ensure that. All right. Well, I don't know if people can hear me now. Am I still fading in and out? Might have. Yeah. No, I think it's better now. Okay. Well, uh, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties. If uh -oh. we didn't get to your questions, we'll get to them later. I think maybe we should just wrap it up for now. Um, since we're having some technical difficulties with uh, sure. GoToWebinar. Uh, Anupa, maybe you would just like to uh, say farewell to everyone. Sure. So, so thank you all for coming. And um, again, as Brian said, we, if you have any questions uh, about the webinar or queries about uh, how to look at the different packages and, and uh, also discuss your requirements, please reach out to, to Brian or myself. You can see the contact information. Brian, if you could flip the slide um, to the next you'll get our contact information and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And again, thank you very much for your time and appreciate you uh, taking the time to join the session. Brian? Thank you everyone. I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar since we're having some audio difficulties, but um, uh, I think Anupam ended it well for everyone in case you can't hear me. And again, we'll follow up with you after the session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.